Hi everyone. Welcome to In Limbo Conversations. Today we have with us Simon Crickley. He's a Hans Jonas Professor of Philosophy at the New School for Social Research. He works on continental philosophy, uh, philosophy and literature, psychoanalysis, ethics and political theory among other domains. For more information about his research, please click on the link mentioned in the video description. Thank you for joining us, Simon. Uh, today, you, I thought, yeah, today I thought I could try something new with you. We got a few sort of letters and description of people's experiences and what they are going through during this pandemic situation. And I thought I could uh -huh. ask you what you think about them and how you relate to them personally. So I tried to sort them what? out by themes. And the first theme is largely love and relationship during the pandemic. So the oh. name of this person is Tapasvi. Tapasvi is a 29-year-old woman who is married and has two children. So for the past five, six months, like that is throughout the lockdown, they have been with each other day in and day out with her spouse and with her children. She says that even though her partner is really nice to her and tries to do everything that would make her comfortable and she loves her children in her words to death, she sometimes just wishes that they were gone, that being with them has become too much for her. And there are instances, she says, where she just loads looking at them and can't understand why. This makes her frustrated and guilty. <laughs> so in relation right. to Tapasri, I wonder there is the part about having to be with someone just about all the time, how that could be encroaching on one's private space. But also there is the comfort of having someone during this tough time. And also just being so immensely loved and being taken care of, especially by your primary caretaker like parents or later your partners, that it becomes unbearable. So how would you understand what she's experiencing, the loathing and frustration of being with someone and the guilt of not wanting those who care for you? Uh, well, I, I understand. I understand the problem. I don't, I empathize with it. Um, but I'm very happy to say that's... Uh, not the situation I find myself in. So, uh, yeah, I don't know how people have been coping with uh, with with young children in particular, and uh, yeah. even even partners. So, I mean, yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, she, she has all my sympathy, but I don't have much in the way of advice. I mean, it's um, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been, yeah, I, I, I know a lot of people with, with kids and um, with, it's been, it's been difficult. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, uh, I'm just happy that <laughs> my son is very grown up and I got a stepson too, and he's also grown up. So um, I don't have that thing to worry about. And um, I mean, I think, dating and relationships in the pandemic. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. Yeah. I'm doing some, um, one of the classes I'm, I'm teaching is this semester is just called Human Observation. And uh, one of the groups uh, of students that's working is gonna be working on, on that question, love in a pandemic, relationships. And we'll see what they find out. Um, but I have no wisdom to pass on. Yeah, so uh, do you, what do you think it's about, like, if you if you look at love, because my area is not this, so you know, I'm going to be just asking you a bit of a no-wise question. I hope you can put up with that. And so what do you think it's about love, about the idea of possession that sort of uh, makes people want someone and at the same time not want them? Do you think it's related to the way pattern in which we relate with as children with everyone like is it is it as adults also like because she feels felt feel, felt that towards her partner as well so looking if love inherently has that nature of wanting but not wanting that always it's a lacanian mirror image where you're just always wanting to go towards and never really sort of uh, satiating yeah. that sex desire yeah yeah i mean it's um i mean you know i um i think uh uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not really a Freudian, but I've learned things from Freud over the years. I'm suspicious of lots in Freud and suspicious of a great deal in Lacan, um, particularly with Lacanians, but that's a separate topic. But the idea that, you know, love is, um, well, love isn't possession. Um, the best formulation I've come up with is the idea that to love is to 
So love is to give what you do not have, right? To give what you do not have um, and to receive that over which you have no power. That's always struck me as about right. So to give what you do not have. So if love becomes possession, I think that becomes a kind of a sickness um, yeah. and it reduces love relations to property relations. It reduces relationships to contracts. I mean, some people do this. I mean, they have understandings, uh, you know, they'll, you do this, I'll do that. That strikes me as a total misunderstanding of love. And uh, so to love someone is to, to know that you do not possess them. It's always that dimension of, there has to be a dimension of something unknown in love. Um, I mean, this is a human being. It's not, uh, you know, it's not um, an object. It's not a thing in the world. And then uh, what you receive is that over which you have no power. There's a kind of, um, at its best, uh, something like grace, an experience of grace in, in, in love. Um, say it on one hand. On the other hand, I think, you know, you know, Freud has a point when he says, hate is older than love. But in a sense, um, the way we tend to bind ourselves to ourselves through hatred is a more, is a more kind of primal emotion than, than love. Sadly, I think he's right. <laughs> this, sort of, this sort of reminds me of, uh, I'm not a very big fan of uh, very watered down novels, but uh, there was Milan Kundera's Unbearable Lightness. And he talked about this moment where this character is looking at his girlfriend and, you know, he's been in apparently madly in love with her and he sees her by these flashy purple shoes. And just that moment is just magnified. And, you know, they're like, I don't know how I love this person, but all around it has been love. And, you know, so, yeah, I do think that the, like, loving can only come if you're aware of the, or of its death. And uh, at the moment where you are with the person in a certain sense. So, uh, yeah, so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, right. So that touches upon something that I wanted to also say about the next subject, who is Maya. This is about children and suicide. And uh, Maya is a 12-year-old girl and she lives with her parents and has no siblings. Her father, Raghav, says that over the last uh, two, three months, she has been asking about death a lot and more specifically that she has dreams where she dies. She asks where people go after death, which is more general. But also what would happen if she was burning? This is probably related to immolation or if a, burden, if a building fell over her. So where Raga posted about this, he, the forum, he was saying that he's a bit concerned about how to look at Maya wondering about her own death. And uh, it seems mm -hmm. natural that children are going to be asking these big questions about life and death and disease during this time. Dr. Lone had talked about this uh, with us a few, a bit back. I was wondering for a child who probably has no control over her surroundings and who is watching probably is undergoing a lot of unrest. Do you think there is a possibility that she's contemplating suicide? Because statistically, there has been an increase in youth suicide attempts over the last five, six, eight, nine months. And do you feel that we can even talk of suicide when it comes to children? So just... Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah you uh, can. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, and you know, uh, the children, are, in my experience, uh, uh, children are, you know, are very preoccupied with death um, in different ways. I mean, in particular, the, the possibility of the death of their, their parents, that's something which, you know, that, that can emerge as a thought very, very young, and it can be quite disturbing for a, a child to know that their parents are not always gonna be around. So uh, I, th I think that the idea of hiding things from kids around death is totally pointless, and there needs to be um, more discussion of that and the one of the virtues one of the virtues of uh, uh, religion well let's say one of the virtues of say Christianity and I'm not a Christian is that it's a very kind of death obsessed religion so at least you get you become aware of the idea of a God who dies and uh, this death having significance and death being something central to human life. So that, I, I don't think you can ever, I don't think you can ever 
disguise anything from children. I think children always uh, can always see through bullshit. They can always see the truth. Um, and so if, uh, and if their parents are unhappy, the children always realize it. So I think the, um, you should talk with kids about uh, death as much as possible. It's a, it's, a, it's a good thing. You can do that through all sorts of examples. I think the, um, the question of suicide in relationship to um, where we are with suicide, it's, uh, yeah, there's, there's a shift in, I mean, I've done a lot, not a lot, I've some writing and thinking about this. And one thing that you find in, um, you look at the history, the sociology of suicide, is that the, the rates of suicide in specific cultures, different cultures vary. More people kill themselves in Hungary than in Austria. We don't know why, but it's a fact. It's a, it's a cultural feature. So there are cultural variations and there are gender variations. More women attempt suicide, more men complete suicide. And the figures there are quite, quite interesting. So those, the suicide patterns, uh, patterns of behavior, uh, and how that features in particular societies. Uh, these, these are things which are, there can be shifts, but they're fairly constant. But there's been a significant change in the last 10 years, in particular with suicide, uh, suicidal ideation and suicidal thought and actual suicides amongst um, uh, teenage girls and uh, even preteen girls and um, a significant increase and then you think well what's changed um, and then what's changed is uh, you know is this social media has changed so so is there a causal connection between social media and suicidal behavior that's very hard to show but there's certainly a correlation between them and um and that's uh and that's really really worrying i mean i've got a lot more to say about that and i don't know what and you can't as a parent you can't win because you can't if you don't allow your your child access to a phone they're a weirdo they're a kind of freak uh, and if you do give them access to a phone, you're exposing them to that that risk, you know, the, the um, whether it's through bullying or whatever it might be. So, yeah, we're in a very strange situation when it comes to. Um, how how do you feel, sort of, um, being in this sort of pandemic? How does it affect the experiential resilience? You know, like all the world view of the child to face such a crisis when they're such at a tender age. You know, like. I, I like you know going through divorce or like these are all different kinds of crises and to be able to see the world around them completely in uncertainty complete change in lifestyle how do you think that sort of affects um well i mean it affects people uh i mean paradoxically i mean in the sense in which i mean there's a lot of talk um uh, there has been a lot of talk in the last uh, months in the united states it was it was really happening in um April and May, and then there was the killing of George Floyd and the, the Black Lives Matter issue became the key issue, but now things are moving back to that. Questions of uh, anxiety, depression, suicide, and the rest. And the, um, uh, the fact is that for people who are melancholics, you know, melancholics, depressives, you know, and most people who are say, you know, I, I think of myself as a kind of, you know, a sort of a normal melancholic. Uh, it's um, when the rest of the world is in a, a state of, you know, anxiety and um, fear with regards to say the pandemic, actually the world feels a much more comfortable place. So. The, the peculiar thing about the pandemic is that people that are really, say, suicidally depressed uh, are less likely to take their lives yeah. during a pandemic. Uh, as all, this, all the research on suicide shows, 
um, certainly in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, the peak, the most popular time for suicide is spring. Um, yeah. People people take their lives not when things are dark and awful and difficult, but when things are getting better. So yeah. the the time that we have to worry about is not now. It's what happens when this changes and, and the um, the fear begins to really lift and uh, you know there's a vaccine and things seem to be getting better. That's yeah. when I imagine there'll be more suicides. Um, okay, so this, <laughs> this reminds me of uh, just one last question about this. It reminds me of the 2013 workshop that you had mentioned in Notes on Suicide, which was I think a suicide yeah, right. creative writing workshop. Like I think it was a parody of the school of death, no? Like given it that was a parody. Right? Yeah, it was Parody of the school of life. Right. And do you think children can yeah. actually, like, given that they're not, like, we think that they're not cognitively developed or exposed to the world to end up the grasp, the idea of giving up on life. Do you think children can write suicide notes? Like, is it a possibility we could have a book which has the suicide notes that children write? Well, there were no children there in that. Actually, there was. There was, uh, yeah, my stepson was there. Yeah, uh, as I remember. My stepson was there for that. Uh, I mean, it, it was a kind of um, uh, a little bit of, say, performance art. We were, me and my friend Sina, Sina Najafi, were trying to poke fun at the um, this thing, the School of Life, which exists, used to exist just in London, but now it's kind of all over the place, uh, which is how, you know, middle class people can feel better through reading bad philosophy. So yeah. we don't like that. And then, uh, and also to kind of, you know, to actually, and also to ridicule creative writing <laughs> and creative writing workshops, to do a suicide note creative writing workshop. It just struck, as a, as a, it struck me as a funny idea. So we did it and um, it was very serious. It was very, very kind of um, the mood. It was, only, it was a tiny, tiny room, but smaller than the room I'm in now. Oh. Just, 15, 18 people stuck in a, a little room that was raining outside. And it was really rather, really rather moving. And um, can kids, you know, children, um, I mean, we were, we were children relatively recently. Uh, they're not that different from us. There has to be, you know, a kind of a legal status that separates children from adults, that's important. But the the idea that, you know, children are in some separate domain, I've always found ridiculous. They, they um, so um, I think the more, uh, um, the more discussion of, the more discussion of, of, of death, of, uh, of things like suicide, the more that that is, uh, discussed openly the better so um, there's a kind of moral panic amongst um, parents um, around questions of suicide that if you tell children about this they're going to sort of yeah. act on it they're not stupid children are not stupid uh, they're children but they're usually pretty clever and um, it's important that they you know, they're, they're, they're told that, you know, that, that, they, yeah, so it's imp very important for this for these things to be discussed. And, um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Okay, so if you're comfortable, that. like, this is a personal question because I just wanted to ask you that you have talked, so uh, you talked about the right to suicide, you know, about letting us exercise our power to choose. And if we reason in this line far enough, how do you feel of antinatalism? Because I've related quite a bit to the way Peter Wessel Zafwe and Emil Chora and Thomas Ligotti talk, look at the world, you know? Do you feel like we are also under an obligation to not bring into this world beings who are condemned to face pain and suffering, especially with the whole pandemic situation? Are we obliged to not choose life for others and give birth? Big question. It's a big question. I mean, it's... Um, I think it's... A question that excites a lot of emotion. I remember when the, I run this column called The Stone with the New York Times, and we did a piece very early on by Peter Singer. Yeah. And uh, he, he just raised the question, well, um, 
given what we know about climate change, say, should we have children? And people freaked out. They freaked out. They went, they went crazy. And so when you raise that question, people go mad. I think it's, sure, it's an issue. I think it's, uh, I, I think we, the, you know, the, I, 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 you know, if people want to, people could do what they what they like, but I think that the world is a strange place to bring people into at the moment. I must say that. I mean, what exactly? Given, given that we know what we know, given that there'll be no, there'll be no climate, uh, there will be no global unified action on on climate change. It's not going to happen. Uh, yeah. It's you know, the best we had the with the Paris Accords, we had you know the Kyoto Accords. Uh, if, if Kyoto had stuck and uh, and people had you know stuck, the governments had stuck with that, then maybe we'd be in a better place. But uh, countries like the United States are you know kind of rogue states that are just you know in denial, doing crazy stuff. Brazil too, and so. Um, I can't, I, at this point, it's very hard to imagine that we, we have the imagination to even think about uh, the future beyond our lives. And that's enormously depressing. So in that context, well, it does raise a question about children, sure. Because to have a child is to imagine a future after your death. That's really, yeah. that's the deal. I mean, you know, if I mean, it will be, a, you know, for a tr it's a tragedy, Oh, it's it's not try. It's it's a horrible thing for a parent to lose a child, for a child to die before a parent. Okay, so when you're having a child, you are imagining a time after your death, and you're imagining a life that continues on into the future. And you know, at this point, we're imagining that life continuing on into the future in a in a climate, yeah, an actual climate, which is which is is heading towards. Uh, a disastrous situation, an unsustainable situation, and and we can't. It's as if that is just too much information to process. I don't know about you, but I mean, say during one thing I was doing during the pandemic, amongst other things, was I was reading a lot about um, a lot of pieces around about climate change. Just um, I had time, I guess. I caught up with a lot of a lot of uh, material and then at a certain point I just couldn't do it anymore it was just too much I couldn't take any more in because you think oh no this is going to be so sad and um so there's a limit to what we can tolerate but the key thing about say climate change is that this is not it's, this cannot be based on how people feel right this yeah. has to be this climate change is an issue where there, there simply has to be Unified governmental action, transnational action. Uh, hopefully, you know, as every nation in the world would that would be great. And there have to be just legal um, obligations that each country has to follow. And if they don't follow it, there have to be sanctions. And that's what we're incapable of even beginning to imagine. And the main culprit in that is the United States. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for me, it's more uh, yeah. like uh, the, it's more troubling for me in this whole situation that it is non-consensual. Like I understand, we are not, we cannot talk of consent when it comes to children who are not born yet. But the very fact that as human beings we are ready to make a decision to bring someone, like even if the world were great, even if the world was a wonderful place to live in, do I have the yeah. right to make that decision from for anyone? Who's potentially going to have a life like I, I like personally I am like I don't believe in marriage or I'm an and I'm an antinatalist but I, I do mm -hmm. like of course I'm ready to revise those views thinking but I feel like I cannot do that for for any being potentially who's going to come you know come into existence and that's uh, yeah I, I do have my I don't think, yeah I don't think it's a question of rights I mean I think it's a question of uh it's much more a question of of habits, uh, traditions, um, uh, expectations. I mean, it's more the you know, the, the shifting the idea that you know, 
if we were, if we're the offspring of somebody, our parents or whoever it might have been, and um, you know, there's a kind of expectation, a, a habit, a, a tradition. Well, okay, well maybe I'll I'll continue to do the same thing. So it's more like that. The question of um, when it comes down to questions of uh, rights, I, I think I always get confused I think it so I think what what would have to be changed would be or and this would this would be a you know an argument that could be made but it's a question of how you persuade people is that given the given the nature of the world that we are moving into in the next 30 50 years then uh, really what should what should human beings do should they should they think more carefully about questions of reproduction? I think they should. I think they should. Um, yeah. I'm looking out the window behind, uh, you can't see this, but I, I'm looking, I have a back garden here, and I'm watching a squirrel kind of hanging from a branch on a tree. It's very strange. How odd. I have a very gymnastic squirrel in my back garden. Anyway, so yeah, so yeah. I, I would say, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm not really a liberal. Yeah. It's a rights. I don't. I don't really do rights discourse. I'm not really keen on that. I'm more. I'm much more of a. I like to think about social and political issues from the perspective of uh, of habits, uh, moral views, uh, yeah. routine traditions, practices. Those types and, of things. Um, yeah, and the more whole intricate relationship between how, like, I, I'm coming from a society where marriage and having children are a sort of, uh, that's the norm. And, you know, I come from India where that's the formula for a happy life. So, um, so yeah, I understand yeah. How, uh, how, how those are very important details to look at. And so I... Um, that are pretty much so as you could see that you know this was naturally uh, these are the things that i wanted to ask you and you know thank you so much for joining me simon it was really great talking to you pleasure, and, A pleasure. and uh, thank you for your questions and it was very nice to talk to you <laughs>